So uh, thank you, Laura. And um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Sam Wisely uh, to everyone who's on this uh, Zoom meeting. Welcome, everybody. Um, so I, uh, Sam, I first met when she first came to the University of Florida uh, into the uh, wildlife, uh, wildlife ecology and conservation department. And uh, she's one of this sort of emerging wonderful next generation of scientists that combines sort of very strong lab skills in her case genetics and uh, disease um, from a laboratory perspective with excellent field skills. And this is something that's very appealing obviously to Archbold, you know, to have partners who work with us that have uh, strengths in both those areas. Um, I've also known her because she was very involved in um, helping to establish um, the Ordway Swisher Preserve as the, one of the National Ecological Observatory Network sites. And our, um, I'm going to actually let her give her a two minute background on uh, her uh, where she did her degrees and training before she came to UF, because when I look clicked on her CV a couple of minutes ago, it went to another link. So I'll let her do that for you. I'm sorry about that, Sam. Um, today, she's sort of going to give us a presentation on disease ecology of wild pigs. Um, and she's going to uh, really give us a reflection on uh, what she's done at Buck Island Ranch, so Archbold's Buck Island Ranch. And this is very exciting for us because it's combining sort of uh, spatial landscape ecology, which is something her lab at UF works very hard on, with disease ecology and particularly the relationship between wildlife as a reservoir and livestock and then con uh, concomitant consequences for human health. So um, she worked extensively with Raoul Boughton. Um, they have a, and um, her lab has, and students have produced a, a sort of raft of publications from the ranch and from many other places, including a lot of work on ticks and hogs and cows. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Sam, and um, I'm sorry, but if you could do the, the one minute on, you know, how you got to UF, that would be extremely helpful. I'm sorry, I didn't have that background information in front of me, and it's really a delight to have you here so thank you for joining us great well um thanks hillary and um it's a it's a real pleasure for me to to be here um so i did my um, bachelor's at university of california at san diego in uh, ecology evolution and animal behavior um, took a couple year hiatus to uh, get a job in the real world quickly retreated back to academia where I got a master's of science in wildlife ecology at Humboldt State University and then went on to do a PhD in zoology and physiology at the University of Wyoming. And there I studied the conservation genetics of the endangered black-footed ferret. Um, I went on to do a postdoc at the Smithsonian Institution for a couple of years and then landed my first academic position at Kansas State University. And I was there for about eight years before moving to Florida. So that's a little bit about my background. And um, actually, it was pretty soon after I moved to University of Florida and really wanted to take up the idea of working in a state that has a plethora of invasive species, second only really to Hawaii in terms of the number of invasive species here, um, and take the skills that I had to really understand the cause and consequences of invasive species. Um, and so um, sort of an obvious first place to start for me then was really with the idea of wild pigs or feral swine. Sometimes I'll use them interchangeably. Um, the IUCN has designated them as the world's worst invasive species, um, both in the distribution of where they are globally. Um, they're found on every continent but uh, Antarctica. Um, and just in terms of the amount of destruction that they can do um, on, on so many different bases. So wild pigs in uh, North America were introduced in the 1400s from the Spanish. They were introduced to Florida first. Um, and they have expanded to nearly all states within the United States. Um, and there's estimated to be more than 5 million individuals. So this map on the left shows feral swine distribution by county 
Uh, the blue is from 1982, and you can see their rapid expansion to 2015, and that's where they're established. If you look at that graph on the right, that's where they've been encountered. So we believe that they've been encountered in 47 of our 50 states, and it looks to me like Wyoming, New Jersey, and maybe the District of Columbia are the only places where they haven't been uh, found. Um, and so what I tried, what I'm going to try to do in this talk is to um, really um, sort of work with uh, through a conceptual model of wild pig expansion um, in North America, thinking about the social drivers that um, um, really facilitated that. Um, they are a species that is very desirable to hunt, and it's actually thought that some of that very rapid expansion that occurred starting in about the 1980s really um, was facilitated by hunting. Um, and so because of that, there's this real tension between people who want to promote feral swine or wild pigs as a hunting opportunity, and those that, that view them as being destructive or um, really impeding human health or being a detriment to human health. And so that really gets in then to the impacts that um, feral swine can have. They do increase hunting opportunities. In Florida, they are the second most hunted species, but only behind white-tailed deer. But they ha can have impacts on other game species and impacts on uh, threatened and endangered species. Um, we suspect, although there's not a ton of documented evidence, that they can highly impact water quality. They certainly create a loss of resources, particularly in the agricultural sector. Um, they uh, are a vector as well as a reservoir for many diseases. Um, and they can have direct effects on um, agricultural commodities. And so, you know, there's this tension, you can actually um, make money on wild pigs um, by being an outfitter or leasing your land to hunters, but you can also lose money because of some of these um, destructive effects. And that really sets up some management decisions that need to be made. You can uh, manage animals for an increasing population or a stable population or you can work to slightly decrease them. I would call those all animal management, as opposed to animal control, which is really the very definitive uh, trying to exclude, eradicate, or greatly decrease an animal's population. So, um, I'm going to really structure my talk around trying to, to make some of these ties between some of these different social drivers, impacts, and outcomes um, in this model. And really the first one I'll talk about, it was really the first one that, that I tried to tackle was this idea of the loss of resources and a loss of commodity in the agricultural sector. Um, and so really within the first few months of, of landing in Florida, um, I was introduced to Archbold's uh, Buck Island Ranch. I had actually met Betsy Boughton at a meeting of a grassland symposium that was at Kansas State University and she really piqued my interest um, in the ranch. Um, there's a really interesting setup at the ranch. So there's semi-native uh, grasslands as well as improved grasslands. Um, and at that time, um, Betsy had indicated to me that there was um, a fair bit of pig damage that was going on. And so if you look at this picture, these, these sort of pocked marked areas of grassland is actually pig rooting. So if you've not seen it before, pigs actually use their snouts to turn over the soil and, and it really looks like a road rooter has gone through there. I mean, they can dig up the soil two to three feet deep um, and, and cause a lot of destruction there. And so um, Betsy and I really wanted to understand, you know, how does pig rooting change forage quality for cattle? And then what is the extent of that uh, rangeland damage? Um, and Raoul Boughton was very instrumental in, in working on this as well. 
So this study was conducted by my student, Brittany Bankovich. And so she had this design where she had in uh, I, both the semi-native and the improved grassland, these paired plots where she would take a meter circle um, and in an undisturbed area and then in an area that had been rooted and she had these multiple replicates. Um, and she really characterized the, the species composition of those forage um, grasses and forbs and herbs in each of those uh, areas um, over the course of a year. And lest you think there aren't a lot of pigs around, um, unbeknownst to us, when we took this picture, there was actually a wild pig right here hiding uh, in, the, in plain sight. So um, out, uh, through the course of this study, we were able to show that um, there was about 60% less forage grass in areas that had been rooted by pigs um, than in areas that had not been rooted by pigs. And that during the course of this year, there was actually active rooting going on. And so about, um, 1.18 hectares had been rooted in uh, the beginning of the study and by the end of the study about 7.7 hectares had been rooted. So there was a seven-fold increase in rooted pasture um, in this area. This is really um, Betsy's um, observation that led to this idea that red root might have something to do with this. So red root is um, a plant that have these rhizomes and really where we saw this rooting occur, we'd see red root shoot up right afterwards. So you can see that in this plot where um, as uh, time progressed, you would see um, in rooted areas, this increase in red root but it also seems like it was this cyclical cycle because where there was more red root, that's also where we saw a bunch of rerooting that would occur. So it really seems to be have this positive feedback loop. And Betsy went on to do some great studies sort of on diet composition and looking at how um, feral swine might, uh, the mechanism by which they might promote that. And then Raul was really instrumental in the economic analysis um, part of this study, whereby we, we took the amount of area that we thought was rooted um, in our um, specific study area, expanding that ranch, ranch wide. So understanding how much of the ranch was semi-native or um, improved pasture, and then understanding how much was lost. So about $17,000 a year um, is lost to rooting by wild pigs. And then if we take that a little bit further and expand that to a four county area where ranching is really predominant in Florida, uh, we estimated that between two and $11 million are lost every year in forage to feral swine because of this rooting activity that they do. So that was a really, um, great first step at sort of, I think really viscerally demonstrating that, that there is this economic loss associated with wild pigs. And people had showed that before with row crop agriculture where it's very easy to see where you have lines of peanuts and all of a sudden oh, there's a whole bunch taken out. I think it's, it was a little bit more difficult to show or a little bit harder to convince people that that was actually a problem until, until we published this study. So um, that was really a nice first step in demonstrating the impact in Florida. Um, my lab, though, is, is typically a bit more focused on diseases of animals um, and um, both the human diseases that are important to human health as well as wildlife health, but also uh, livestock health as well. And so that was sort of a next obvious step to take um, for understanding wild pigs in, in Florida. Um, 
And wild pigs carry a ton of pathogens. 45 known pathogens are shared between feral swine and other species. So feral swine obviously can share some diseases with humans, brucellosis, toxoplasmosis are some things that don't even exist yet in North America and hopefully never will, but things like Japanese encephalitis, a foreign disease that if it came to Florida could be um, very impactful to human health here. Um, feral swine also can have an impact on domestic swine if there's some biosecurity issues and the two could come in contact and so diseases could pass into the commercial industry. Um, there are some foreign animal diseases that would devastate the commercial industry, but there's also a lot of pathogens that circulate in um, this area uh, um, between them that are present already in Florida as well as North America. Um, feral swine can also pass some uh, diseases on to companion animals or working animals. So people who hunt wild pigs lose dogs, hunting dogs every year to um, pseudo rabies virus. Um, and some of those same pathogens can also impact wildlife species as well. And so for threatened and endangered species, this can be uh, quite devastating. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about these as I, as I move on. So wild pigs are really an amazing um, uh, group of animals to think about in terms of disease ecology because the different pathogens that they um, can carry can actually be transmitted by many multiple different mechanisms. And so it actually sort of creates this very rich study system. So they carry multiple pathogens that have different pathogen biologies that are different in different phyla, that are viruses, that are protozoans, that are bacteria. Um, that can be transmitted in different ways. Some can, are directly transmitted, some are vector-borne, some are waterborne, um, and some are, are aerosolized. They have different levels of environmental persistence. They can involve other wildlife reservoirs or, uh, or not. Um, and then they can impact multiple different types of, of uh, species, whether it be humans or wildlife or, or other things. So, so there's a very rich system actually to work in. Um, and so one of the very first things I wanted to do um, is to understand a little bit better what the, um, entire, um, what I would say, um, microbiome of, of, uh, of wild pigs were. And so I collaborated with the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And at the time, they had a microarray um, chip that had these oligonucleotides of all known pathogens at the time. So this, this chip can hold several million different bits of DNA that are complementary to known pathogens. And so what we did was extract um, DNA and RNA from pigs um, from the feces and from the blood and wash it over these microarray chips and it would tell us what pathogens popped up. And so this was just a very nice way to um, get an assessment of what the diversity of pathogens were in the system that we were in. Um, and so you can see that there were some, um, this is just some simple results. These are um, the locations that we sampled. Here is uh, Buck Island Ranch. Um, and here are multiple um, viruses that we found within uh, the system, some of which we then, of course, went on to study. We've done a lot of studies on herpes viruses and torcotenovirus in particular. Um, we also found a fair number of these in the feces as well. Um, and one of the ones that we found is actually called uh, Powassan virus. So this is a tick-borne virus that we were very interested in. And so one of the first things we wanted to do was uh, conduct a study of, uh, of tick-borne pathogens in, in feral swine here. And so one of the uh, pathogens that we were quite interested in is uh, rickettsia. Um, so these are a bacteria that cause spotted fever, um, 
illnesses in Floridians as well as others. It's transmitted by ticks, um, but can be transmitted amongst other wildlife. And if an infected tick that um, got that pathogen from either a pig or other wildlife then bites a human, it transmits that pathogen to people. And so, um, Spotted fever rickettsiosis is actually on the increase in Florida as well as in the US. Um, I had a student, Carrie DeJesus, who conducted a statewide um, surveillance for uh, rickettsiosis in uh, Florida. Um, and here you can see there where human cases are. This is, these are data that she received from Florida Department of Health. These are the ticks that are positive for um, human uh, case or for ticks that were positive. And then these darker circles is where there were human cases as well as ticks that we found that were positive. And though you can see that, that most of these cases occur and that the rickettsia is found in Northern Florida, the white just simply means that there's never really been much sampling that's occurred here. So this is really kind of a black hole of sampling. And so, um, my student, uh, Mary Lee, actually conducted um, a study um, um, on tick-borne diseases at Buck Island Ranch uh, for her PhD dissertation. Um, so this was um, a collaborative study with Raul Bouton. So Raul had been um, collecting pigs, has been for a number of years, um, and he allowed Mary to um, come on and collect ticks off of all of the animals that he was handling. She also did drags across the um, uh, the ranch. And one of the first things she wanted to know is, you know, what, what's the best methodology for sampling in the South? Um, and it turned out that for her, sampling from pigs was actually much more fruitful, both in the diversity of ticks that she was able to get and, and the sheer numbers that she was able to get. So it really turned out that, that wild pigs are sort of a great sentinel for um, collecting ticks and understanding tick ecology in certain areas. Um, and indeed, she found four different species of tick at Buck Island Ranch. And... Um, the by far the most abundant that she found were Gulf Coast ticks, Amblyoma maculatum. And 10% of those ticks that she tested were positive for a rickettsial species called Rickettsia parkeri. And this is actually pretty exciting and interesting because Rickettsia parkeri is an emerging pathogen in North America. Um, we have always attributed most of um, spotted fevers to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but I think that's because our diagnostic, human diagnostic assays were gauged towards that. And as our diagnostic assays is um, in, increase in the ability to detect diversity in those pathogens, we're seeing that Parker eye is actually kind of becoming a big player. So that's just a little bit of a snapshot of some of the human disease work that we've done with pigs on Buck Island Ranch. Um, and so sort of the next thing I want to talk about is um, uh, the um, some of the other diseases that can be transmitted. So brucella is a disease that is transmitted by pigs to pigs um, and its impact is really on cattle. So really trying to understand um, diseases that might affect cattle. And in this case, we didn't really um, uh, study the disease per se, but really this gets into um, the area of research that I've been strongly collaborating with Raul on, and that is trying to understand how feral swine move on the landscape, how cattle move on the landscape, and how those two can facilitate transmission, and really how some uh, ranch practices can facilitate transmission of some of these directly transmitted diseases. So really, uh, on a, a very specifically, one of the things we wanted to know is at the local scale, how are pigs utilizing the landscape and what microbes, microbes do they share with livestock and with wildlife? Um, and so this involves studies of animal movement and habitat use. 
We'd love to include some energy budget stuff, but molecular epidemiology has really been the focus of, of my part of the collaboration with Raul. Um, we had a student, um, uh, Andrew Satterley, that collaborated with Raul, whereby they put out uh, camera stations at um, food plots as well as um, supplemental feed tubs that had molasses. Um, to really sort of understand who was using these and does that create zones of contact. Um, and as you can see at these food plots, the fer feral swine actually used them as much or more than other native wildlife there and that there was this, this big zone of overlap in time. So not only was there spatial overlap, but there was also temporal overlap as well in these species. And that was really true too of these molasses feeders as well. So um, you can see here that they're both in very close uh, contact with each other. In fact, we've seen them both heads in at the same time at these feeders, kind of a, a large time of contact between the two. Um, and just to say that, that this is really, this is work that, that um, my student Andrew and I just scratched the surface of Raul and the, with the work that he's done has really, really taken this to a much greater de degree with uh, some camera um, arrays that he's set up as well as proximity collars. So he really took that ball and, and ran with it. But this was going back to that microarray. One of the things that we found that was really interesting to us um, and that we've uh, pursued a bit is um, a virus called torcatenovirus. These are really interesting viruses. They're anelloviruses, um, they're circular DNA viruses, and they're, they're titchy little things. So they're only about 2,800 base pairs long. So very, very small, small genomes, which makes them really tractable to work with in the laboratory. Very easy to, um, to visualize um, genetically. Um, they also seem to be quite ubiquitous. And so our idea was that perhaps we could use them to better understand how more important diseases, diseases that we think have a huge impact on livestock and that could be disastrous if they were shared between pigs and cattle. But maybe we could use these as a sentinel virus to understand the epidemiology of this ranching system to better understand what would happen if a foreign animal disease came in. So here is our torcatenovirus, quite small. Um, it replicates in bone marrow cells and then sheds into the bloodstream um, and then sheds through the mucosal linings. And so this is a study that's ongoing right now with my student Brandon Parker. Um, and really his job has been to really let us know if this pathogen is going to be appropriate for what I just described. So is it going to occur at a high enough prevalence? Does it persist? How does it behave? Is, it, um, is there enough diversity so that we actually can study this and use some of the molecular epidemiological modeling approaches that we would like to do? And so this here is a phylogenetic tree of torcatenovirus one at Buck Island Ranch. And um, this phylogenetic tree really just describes the genetic relationship between individual strains that are found in individual pigs. So every dot here represents a pig that was sampled at Buck Island Ranch that had this virus. And the first thing I should say is that we actually found this virus at a prevalence of 40%. And that's great for us because that means that we will actually have some um, statistical power to do some of the things that we want to do. I'm not going to show you the data, but we correlated the, um, the presence or absence of this virus with body condition 
And we didn't find any difference in body conditions between animals that were infected and animals that weren't. And, and that goes with what, we've, what has been published about Turcoteno. It's not really known to cause any clinical illness in pigs. Um, what was interesting to us is that about 10% of our individuals were co-infected with different strains. And so if you take a look at this phylogenetic tree, the, the different variants here are clustered into A, B, C, and D. So those are subtypes of the Torquateno Seuss virus one, which is the name, the full name of this virus. And what's cool is that you can see that all four variants are found on Buck Island Ranch. And not only that, but there's variability within each one of those, uh, those variants of the virus. So there's lots of diversity in this virus. It mutates very quickly. And that's important because that means that if it mutates enough between transmission between one individual to another, we can actually use that to trace back um, the transmission um, network of this virus, which is exactly what they're doing right now with um, SARS virus 2 to understand where outbreaks originated from, like in the Rose Garden. And so, um, so that's a little bit more about how um, we're studying diseases in agricultural production and sort of where we're going next uh, um, in terms of next steps with this virus. Um, and so I wanted to take a, a few minutes um, during the sort of last half of this talk to sort of step back and think more about the um, the management that we actively do right now for, for wild pigs in Florida, um, which is really this interesting tension between where, it just depends really where the animal is. So if it's on a wildlife management area, it is managed sometimes to keep, to sustain populations, the exact um, population size that they are, or even increase them. So some places actually have bag limits on the number of animals you can take. Whereas there are other agencies like USDA that are actively working with landowners to eradicate or uh, actively decrease their numbers. And so um, this is just a really rich area to study them because I, for me, one of the most fascinating things is how do, does active management of an animal impact uh, disease transmission and uh, dynamics? And so I'll talk a little bit about that next. So I'm going to talk about a pathogen called pseudo-rabies virus. Um, this is actually not a rabies virus. It is a herpes virus um, that is directly transmitted from pig to pig. Um, and it typically causes very little clinical illness, particularly in adult pigs. Unweaned um, piglets can sometimes succumb to the disease, and that seems to be mostly in a domestic uh, commercial setting. Um, but it is, a, it is a pathogen that disseminates throughout the body when it's being actively um, uh, shed. So you, you can find it in feces, you find it in the meat of the animal. Um, and one of the most insidious things about this pathogen is that while it doesn't cause much clinical illness in pigs themselves, it is highly lethal to carnivore species. And actually one of our audience members today, Dr. Bob McLean, was one of the first people to demonstrate that, um, that this was a highly pathogenic virus in Florida panthers. And so, uh, again, what I, uh, as I was saying, how do management practices enhance the risk of disease transmission among wild pigs and wildlife? This is something that really, really interests me. And these are just some, some uh, random photos that, uh, that Andrew and Raul collected when they were doing their food plot study. So these are actually uh, corn feeders that were set out, but you can see pretty random interactions between raccoons and hogs, as well as deer and raccoons. And so these seemingly unlikely interactions that might occur between wildlife, I think probably do occur more often than, than we actually think. And, and I think our game cameras have actually showed us a fair bit of that. 
Okay, so, so I am going to talk a bit about Florida panthers um, and the impact that wild pigs and pseudo rabies might actually have on this species. So um, the former distribution of Florida panthers is throughout the southeastern United States um, and their present range is uh, just south of the ranch, but uh, Highlands County is definitely a um, area where panthers are moving into. Um, and so I know that the ranch regularly has sightings of them on, on the ranch. So in Florida, wild pig is the most abundant prey species in the diet of the Florida panther. Um, second only, or not second only, the second most is deer. Um, and so we know they're a very important prey item. Um, and in particularly in Southern Florida, that has been one of the main explanations I've heard for why Florida Wildlife Commission is really reluctant to do anything to manage wild pigs for lower, um, lower pig production, particularly in, in Southern Florida. But we know that wild pigs and PRV contributes to, to Florida panther death. And so in a collaboration with Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission's veterinarian, Dr. Mark Cunningham, we were able to assist them to um, increase the number of confirmed PRV cases that uh, Florida panthers have. So many of their uh, of Florida panthers are radio collared. When they get, get a mortality signal on that panther, a team goes out, collects the carcass, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and tests it to see what the cause of death was. In cases where they're actually able to find virus, that's a confirmed case, where they have histopathology or other evidence, um, gross, gross anim um, anat anatomy that shows PRV, then that is a probable, and then a suspect animal is an animal that simply just kind of drops dead. One of the things that Dr. McLean showed is that there are just really a few lesions on the brain is one of the only um, gross ways that we show that the animal has died unless you can show signs of the virus. They die so quickly being from a healthy animal to a dead animal as a result of PRV encephalitis. <clears throat> excuse me, that, um, that this is a very um, difficult disease to diagnose if you don't have um, uh, tissue specimens. But nonetheless, using uh, our laboratory, um, Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission was able to, sh to show that PRV is actually the third highest known cause of death in Florida panthers. Um, Intraspecies aggression is the, is the number one, uh, vehicle collision is number two. So we were able to show that between nine and 22% of mortalities come from PRV. And so this is actually a, a publication that's under review now in the Journal of Wildlife Management. So one of the things that our lab helped to show was that um, that these pseudo rabies virus was actually coming from Florida pigs. And while we, there was no, logically, there's no other place it could come from, we really wanted to put the nail in the coffin and show that. And so, again, this is a phylogenetic tree of all of the pseudo rabies viruses that were, have been collected from pigs, kind of globally, actually. And if you zoom in right here, these are the sequences of pseudo rabies virus from Florida panthers from three individuals here. And the most closely related pig sample is one of our Florida feral swine pigs that, have, that was pseudo rabies positive. So showing that it really is transmission between Florida wild pigs and Florida panthers that is causing the death of these panthers. And so this really leads us into um, some of the studies that um, my student Felipe Hernandez did, um, both on the ranch and uh, across, the, really the Kissimmee River Valley was the, the, the main um, focal point of his study. 
Um, but he showed that um, about 55% of animals carry the virus. So using serology to understand how many pigs were exposed and therefore we think we're carriers. But then how many animals were actually shedding virus? Because this is, this is a herpes virus. And just like a herpes virus, like our cold sores, it's a lifetime um, a virus that you keep for a lifetime, but you don't, you're not always infectious. You're infectious typically when you're stressed out. So even though you're always a carrier, you're not always shedding. And so we do think that stress induces the shedding of that virus and that populations throughout Florida were shedding at between a, a 17 and 70 percent of the time when we took uh, a snapshot of their actual shedding. So that's a lot of opportunity for any carnivore species to come in contact with an infectious pig, whether it be someone's hunting dog or a Florida panther or a black bear or any of the other species um, that could be impacted. And so one of the things that we hypothesized was that if stress actually causes increasing in shedding and transmission, because it's this herpes virus, then we might expect a higher exposure of PRV in hunted areas. And not just areas that had rifle hunting, but in particular, we were really interested in areas that um, had dog hunting because dog hunting can be very disruptive to this highly gregarious highly social animal so even if not many animals are killed because it's not a particularly efficient way to hunt it really does disperse those animals very quickly and so they can spend a lot of time trying to find their social groups reorganizing social groups and we hypothesize that that might be a fairly stressful event on these animals and therefore might cause them to shed more and then transmit more disease amongst each other. And indeed, one of my students um, did a really lovely statistical analysis of multiple sites across Florida to show that every age group, when it was found on an area that allowed dog hunts, had higher seroprevalence than populations that were um, not on um, hunted areas or that did not allow dog hunts at all. So overall, we definitely found that there was higher PRV in areas with dog hunts than areas without dog hunts. And so we use this to highlight some of the pseudo rabies hotspots that then overlapped with Florida panther distribution, um, as well as their, uh, the area in which they're moving into. Um, and made recommendations that in these areas, perhaps allow hunting because rifle hunting did not really seem to increase it, but it was the dog hunting, the areas that allowed dog hunting that didn't. And so particularly in areas of expansion, um, we've made the recommendation to limit or curb the amount of dog hunting that goes on. And this is true particularly, this is just showing some of the wildlife management areas and public lands that are controlled um, that, that that these management decisions actually could be made on, that could have an impact on Florida panther populations. So this is really a snapshot of uh, the wild pig research that, that we're doing in my lab, um, trying to understand um, sort of how these social drivers influence the impacts on um, both wild pigs as well as other species um, and how that can influence and how we can make some management decisions that would otherwise um, not influence pigs. Um, this is a very collaborative effort. Um, I had lots of graduate students involved, many colleagues at Archbold as well as at other places, and lots of funding agencies as well that were involved. So um, I thank you, and I'm very happy to take any questions.
Okay, um, <laughs> nice last slide. Um, first of all, I wanted to personally thank you very much. I found that a really great overview seminar and I learned a lot during it. So um, a personal thank you from me. I know we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who have some questions. So stick them in that Q&A um, or if you can't manage that in the chat and I'll try and feed these to Sam in a, in a logical way. Great. So the first question, and I'm going to turn it into a question because it's a statement, but I think it could be a good mm -hmm. question. It's from Caroline Cohen. And Caroline, um, you know, went back to that very nice chart you've got of humans, management decisions, wildlife, the, the one that you've used, and pointed out that there are several diseases um, and insects that are exotic to the USA, uh, screwworm, et cetera. And what would be your comments looking at that chart if you put on your head of which of these are non-native and which of these are native? Would you, would you sort of, um, what comments would you make if you, you re-looked at that chart? And I don't know whether you can pull it up again or not. Yes, there it is, great. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, really one of the, the ways in which I like to use this chart is, you know, we're never going to be able to introduce and have experiments where we, we do this, although we have had screwworm fairly recently. But I think if we, we use this type of uh, logic framework to understand diseases that are here now and what human, how humans impact those, we can create models to think of scenarios for foreign animal disease incursions. And so that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do with Torquateno. You know, what if another, um, disease that behaves similarly, something like foot and mouth disease were to get into feral swine, how could we change some of our uh, agricultural production um, practices so that it limits the interaction between livestock, say, and feral swine? Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, and then Raul had a question. Um, so are there other wildlife species that carry and shed PRV that would be comparable to wild pigs? So there is no other carrier of PRV. Um, there are other examples of herpes viruses mm -hmm. that are, have no um, noticeable disease syndromes in um, in the, the, the species in which it evolved. And so an example on that in which, that I've worked on is the uh, macaques in Silver Springs, uh, Florida. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so, so they carry a herpes virus, herpes virus B, that causes no disease to them whatsoever. But we've found that they shed at a rate of about 10%, and that's a deadly disease to humans. Mm -hmm. So that would be something that would be comparable. Yeah. Oh, I had a sort of follow-up question. So I was thinking about the early work that Paul Gibbs did on the ranch on pseudo rabies. Uh, I think at the vet from the vet school at UF. Um, did he actually keep any samples or things? Uh, I have a two-part question. Did he keep any samples or things that could go back so we could look at whether there'd been genetic changes from the samples that he collected to now? Yeah, so so he has a collaborator that has all of those samples at, mm -hmm. at the vet school and we have begged and pleaded and oh. to no avail. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, that's always a good thing for me to have in the back of my head because um, <laughs> I often think one of the wonderful things about a field station is people collect data and it gets archived and they collect samples and they get archived and then 20 years later it has a sort of extraordinarily double value that the vintage is worth it for another for another purpose. So um, I agree. I'm sorry to hear that because would you would you anticipate some change? I mean, are you curious about that? Well, um, I am, and, and not even ju not just the change, but the diversity of the virus. Okay. You know, how, how many sources of PRV are there coming into the ranch? And, you know, we didn't have mm -hmm. very many samples to work with, so we were very lucky that we were able to get that one out. But mm -hmm. it's not a particularly quickly evolving virus, so I don't know that I would expect to see a lot of change. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, otherwise, I think the diversity question would be very interesting. Right. And uh, um, I'll leave my part two to later because Betsy's got a question. 
Um, how does land use intensity, and I'm, I'm assuming she means everything from crops through semi-native native rangeland to, you know, improved pastures, the full range, affect the diseases that animals carry? Have you been able to sample pigs that live in primary natural habitats and compare them to those that are used for agriculture? So we've, we've done a little bit of that. So we've, we've done bits and pieces. So um, my student Felipe Hernandez did a really nice study where he was able to show um, genetically um, gene flow between populations that had different um, land uses between them and definitely urban areas um, con contributed to the stoppage of yeah. gene flow. And we would presume then that there would be less disease transmission among them because they would be more isolated. But he had another paper that also showed that, that um, human assisted migration is huge mm -hmm. in Florida. Mm -hmm. So people move pigs around a lot. Mm -hmm. So land use intensity tells some of the story, but not uh, others of the story. Mm -hmm. There's a student right now that I'm collaborating with in entomology, and it's ongoing, so I don't have results, but she's sampling pigs near very urban areas and then further away in rural areas, and she's very interested in ectoparasites of them, trying to understand the community composition of ectoparasites on pigs and how they differ in urban and rural settings. Oh, um, she might be interested in, there was a UCF master thesis comparing um, disease um, exposure in mosquitoes in um, along Route 70 from agricultural, well, it was at Archbold, the station, the ranch, and in urban edge areas, and found that the rate of prevalence was actually higher in the urban edge areas than in the sort of more, um, than in the agricultural lands or the, or the, or the natural lands. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'll get that. Um, I'm going to encourage a couple of other people to put a question in, otherwise I'll have to ask my next question. So go ahead and put something in the Q&A, but in the meantime, I'll sneak, uh, I think we've still got a minute or two, I'll sneak, um, I'll sneak another question in. So I was thinking about stress and I was thinking about, um, you know, one of the ways you measured stress is the presence or absence of uh, dog hunting. But, um, you know, is it possible with hogs to measure stress with, say, cortisol levels or some hormone level? And then also I was wondering about, does uh, high population size in hogs cause stress and because um, you know there is a bias that people might be hunting areas that have got lots of hogs so maybe it's just the presence of lots of hogs so wanted to throw that out. Yeah so that's the million dollar question so we really have not made the link between stress it's sort of the, the yeah. what we're inferring mm -hmm. and we would we I mean I've I, ha I have a, a a grant proposal in my pocket. I'm ready to pull out anytime anybody wants to fund me to do some stress work because I, um, I think that's that is the, the missing link right there for sure. Um, so it'd be really nice to be able to tie that and I mean Hillary I think with all of these studies the missing question is is population density and unfortunately um, Fish and Wildlife Commission does not collect any data whatsoever on um, at their hunter check stations on wild pigs, um, even though they collect those same data for deer. So there have been some really nice publications that have come out from California using um, uh, bag numbers of wild pigs to at least get an idea of relative density of wild pigs and have been able to show that, yes, of course, density is important, but we just don't have that kind of information here in Florida. But yes, I do think it's critically important. And I think either too high or too low could, could, could show, um, could be stressful. Yeah, I think Raoul is adding a comment on this, which I'm trying to understand. I'm just going to read it. <laughs> also with stress, are the areas with hunt dogs not on ag areas where food might be highly available? So, oh, so could they be resource depleted areas, perhaps, um, where they are, and that might be contributing to stress. Mm -hmm. You know, agriculture, at least in terms of, um, of pseudo rabies presence, so that was another study by um, Felipe, 
really was dependent on um, it, 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 it was, um, had a, a fluctuating relationship with canopy cover. So, so it's a complicated relationship and I don't think it explains everything, but yes, I mean, I think the surrounding habitat always plays, plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. So again, say, I think understanding exactly um, the role of stress and how that's related to hunting would be really important to know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Betsy's got this more fundamental question, um, tying together sort of operations with science. And uh, she's interested in the net effect of ag wild pigs on ag operations. And this is the outcomes part of your conceptual model. And what do you think the missing pieces are that we still need to understand net impacts? Right. So, you know, we make a lot of hand waving assumptions about how much money people make off of wild pigs. So outfitters and leasing rights and how much people make when they sell pigs. But I don't, to my knowledge, there haven't been any proper economic analyses. Um, so, I mean, I think the next step would, that would be really cool to do is tie those losses with a landowner's gains and really see, uh -huh. of course, what that net difference is and if there is um, a, a net loss or gain in income. Okay. So we're, we're, we're heading to close and we've answered most of these very good questions. So thanks everyone. Um, I just wanted to again, thank you and also share with you my observation on this seminar. That, you know, I've read several of your papers over the years and, you know, and from Raoul and from Betsy as well. And pulling this together really helped me. It was very powerful. And it makes me think that maybe some sort of review paper in the future would be really helpful because it just, um, you know, we often interact with owners who are really interested in these questions. And just having this sort of all synthesized was just, um, for me, quite enlightening. And I'm sure for everybody else that was listening. So thank you very much for doing that. Appreciate it. Or we appreciate it. So, And I think we're going to see you soon. I think you've got a who is the new student is it Carrie de Jesus that's coming down um, yeah Carrie well Carrie just finished up and okay. so um, she she had a super successful season and everybody there was magnificent and very right. helpful so um, but yeah you'll see me again you always do well we'll find another <laughs> well you'll find another good project so I think at that point we'll close it and um, again appreciate everybody coming Laura do you want to um, uh, announce uh, any upcoming seminars or things coming up next yes I do we have two more seminars coming up in October join us again in two weeks for a Thursday seminar as we hear more from Buck Island Ranch Dr. Betsy Bouton and Dr. Nuria Gomez Casanovas present Does Patch Burn Grazing Enhance the Delivery of Ecosystem Services from Subtropical Humid Grasslands? And also on Friday, October 23rd at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, we're hosting a special collaborative event with the East Foundation in Texas. It's called East and West Comparing Species at the East Foundation in Texas and Archibald Biological Station in Florida. This will be a joint virtual tour live from both Texas and Florida. And both of those you can find to register on our website. And um, the East Foundation one, uh, we're reaching out to uh, lots of students and I think also high school students. So it has a broad audience, that one. So I think uh, we're excited about trying new things. And I think um, if you have nothing else, Laura, I think that I would just thank everyone for attending. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the good questions and look forward to seeing you um, online again. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Sam. Everyone have a great day. Yeah, thank you, Sam.